Thank you. So I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about regenerative medicine. You've heard, I think, some about it, and uh, I'm going to give you some of my viewpoints in the next uh, 35, 40 minutes. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, so what are we talking about? We're talking about harnessing the body's innate capacity to heal itself and using the body's own biology to elicit a healing response. And you can do that a number of ways. We can use cellular therapies that utilize paracrine signals from stem cells, or we can use proteins or growth factors to modulate the inflammatory response, recruit other cells into the injury site and to jumpstart or accelerate the healing process. But some of these patients uh, have tried a lot of other therapies. They may be really desperately looking for help. And it's important to make sure that we don't get in front of our skis and overpromise and uh, take advantage of their situation. So I think that's something you have to keep in mind in regenerative medicine these days. So the art of regenerative medicine. This painting depicts that the ancient Greeks may have known of the body's innate ability to regenerate tissue. This is Prometheus who apparently stole fire from the gods and Zeus did not like that. So Zeus sentenced Prometheus to eternal punishment. Uh, he was chained to a rock and an eagle was said to eat his liver each and every day. And the liver would regenerate, and the next day the bird would return, and he would eat it again. So the Greeks knew that the body had innate ability to regenerate tissue. In the Renaissance, uh, there was art that already depicted the replacement of body parts. This transplantation of a leg by Saints Cosmas and Damien, who were two brothers, they were Syrian physicians who were said to be able to transplant body parts, assisted by angels. There are various depictions of this, and even in the 16th century, there were attempts at tissue transplantation. Tissue transplantation blossomed in the late part of the 20th century with kidneys, bone marrow, liver and lung, and pancreas and heart. But replacement is not what we are trying to do. What we are trying to do is regenerate. We want to be able to regenerate as much as we can. And regeneration back in the 1860s, Kahnheim postulated that primitive reparative cells came from bone marrow, and almost exactly, exactly a century later in Cleveland, uh, Dr. Kaplan was able to identify CFUFs, colony forming unit fibroblasts that had differentiation potential that were isolated from bone marrow in the 1960s. And these cells were found to have the ability to differentiate into various musculoskeletal cell types, and we rely on this currently in what we are trying to do with regenerative cellular biology. So the art of this practice of medicine is to determine how we apply this by the educated and trained physician based upon the science. So the art and the science complement each other and cannot stand alone. And that's true of all of medicine, but it's particularly true of a new young field such as regenerative medicine where there is perhaps more art than science. So biologics, where do they go in our treatment cascade? Where do they go in our treatment algorithm? Well, for simple musculoskeletal injuries, we might start with rest and compression elevation. We might use steroids, and then we might go on to opioids or surgery. But it's up to the clinician to decide what kinds of biologics to use. And ideally, there's a place in your practice, and there certainly is in mine, to suggest regenerative therapies before opiates and before surgical treatment. So it's important that a physician who considers regenerative medicine understand the nature of the biologics. Uh, Jeff uh, did a good job of explaining this. MSCs are derived from parasites off blood vessels. It's a cell-based therapy, and these cells have the ability to sense the environment and respond over weeks or even months, and he presented a nice paper recently published this year that showed that if you label these cells, uh, you can find them in the substance of the disc when removed at surgery, even eight months or even up to 28 months later. So 
some of these cells may be sticking around and having an effect for quite a long time. In addition to cellular therapy, I mentioned that there are non-cellular growth factor or protein therapies such as platelets and PRP, as well as birth products, uh, amniotic and placental-based products. And whatever the dose is that the patient receives is what they get. So in these therapies, it doesn't matter what status the tissue is in or what status it goes to after the injection, you basically get a one-time delivered dose of a growth factor, as opposed to the cellular therapies where the cells may be able to sense the environment may be able to real-time change the environment so that we can move along the healing cascade. And exosomes, the third category, are gaining momentum. These are little signals, a message in a bottle, so to speak. They tell the local cells that receive them some message. It's not a cellular therapy. It's not a protein. It's a message. It's a signal to try to elicit a response. So, Good science meets good medicine. We want to see high levels of clinical efficacy. If you're gonna offer something to your patient, it should be a therapy that's based upon at least some degree of clinical research, and it should also have evidence of clinical safety. And we're all trying to look for patient satisfaction. We have to do good business as well. We need to understand where the FDA stands on any of these growth factors or any of these biologics we're using, because that seems to be a moving target. We also have to make sure that our malpractice carrier is aware of what we're offering and that we're in compliance with our state medical board and that we manage patient expectations and don't promise or specifically don't overpromise to patients. So MSCs are the most potent type of cell that we can obtain from an adult individual. Uh, these cells naturally respond to traumatic injury and inflammation. When we pull bone marrow and concentrate the WBCs, a small portion of those nucleated cells are MSCs, and that's what we're injecting back into the tissue. These cells can respond to the inflammation by secreting all these signals you see here. They are anti-scarring, anti-apoptotic. They also have innate uh, antimicrobial ability, and they can modulate control the levels of inflammation in real time to move along the healing cascade from inflammation to remodeling to homeostasis. And then when they're done, they return to the vessels as parasites waiting for the next time that they're needed. So is there a way to dose your regenerative medicine? Uh, can we establish a dose response curve, which really is going to be necessary to bring regenerative medicine into the mainstream? So this has been done to some degree with cellular therapies. It's much more difficult with therapies that are not cellular. But with cellular therapies, particular MSCs, uh, Philippe Ernigou has led the way here with several studies where he has looked and quantified the number of MSCs per ml he's injected. And he's found that there is a basement level over which he sees success and under which the patients failed. And we'll go into this in more detail in a few minutes. But this has been shown in a vascular necrosis of the hip, in non-union of tibial fractures, in lumbar fusion, and in the intervertebral disc uh, with the Ken Patin study. So if we're going to quantify, let's talk a little bit about how that might be done. MSCs, or the CFUF, which is another expression for MSCs, they're the most characterized element of regenerative medicine. Being able to count them allows us to have more information to share with our patients and to give us information about the level of therapy that we're providing. These, again, are paraphytes from the vessels of connective tissues. They have a paracrine effect, and you can enrich them by doing a good aspiration using good technique in your bone marrow aspirate to try to obtain the highest number of cells. And you can enrich them further by a uh, having a good mechanism to uh, centrifuge and uh, uh, spin these and uh, capture these cells within the Buffy coat. So counting MSCs is complicated for the physician to do at the bedside. There are a number of ways to do this. You can use flow cytometry. That's where you stain with uh, immunofluorescent dye a specific surface marker of the cell. In regards to MSCs, that is generally CD146, which is a protein that is involved in adherence to blood vessels. And if you stain for that and count the cells that 
pick up the stain, you can get an idea of the number of MSCs. That takes about an hour, and you need a flow cytometer. The old school way of doing this is actually plating these cells onto a plate and incubating them for seven to 10 days, then staining them and counting the colonies. That's uh, quite difficult. Obviously, that's not going to be good for bedside use. You can't wait a week to get your result before you inject. So although these are quite good, neither of these are really applicable currently to the bedside, although there are some companies that are providing flow cytometry uh, as uh, a possible option in your office, but I think that the cost is uh, somewhat prohibitive. So you can also look at CD34. It's another surface marker. This is a marker for primitive adult stem cells, particularly HSCs, but also some MSCs carry this surface marker. It's very commonly studied because really when you do bone marrow transplants, when those are done, uh, the cells that they're interested in are the HSCs. So there seems to be a link between CD34 cells and regenerative capacity that play an assistive regulatory role in addition to the MSCs, and you can see this is from patine. And what I want to point out here is on the right, you can see uh, VAS scores uh, are plotted uh, versus the CD34 concentration. And what this graph shows is that the patients that had the higher CD34 concentration had a better clinical outcome than those with a lower CD34 cell concentration. And these are particularly, are predominantly HSCs. So it's not just the MSCs and the bone marrow concentrate that are important. There's other components of bone marrow concentrate, other progenitor cells that are helpful as well. So see if you, F assays and flow cytometry are good tools. They're not uh, pragmatically uh, uh, really something available for clinical practice. So it's difficult to have a real-time analysis. How do you know whether you harvested well, whether your bone marrow harvest was good? And how do you know whether your process, that is how you concentrate, is effective? So there is a surrogate that you can use that is available and uh, is much less expensive, and that's simply doing counts of total nucleated cells. And essentially, this is just like doing a, a white blood cell count on your sample. In peripheral blood, there's about five to eight million white blood cells per ml. And in a decent bone marrow sample, you should have certainly greater than 10 million white blood cells per ml, and hopefully greater than 20 million if you do a, a really good job. So if you have less than 10 million total nucleated cells per ml, you just got peripheral blood. And that happens. Jeff showed a slide of uh, from patine study where there was a big syringe attached to the jam sheeting needle. And in that study, they just put, it, put the needle into one place in the marrow cavity and pulled 60 cc's, most of which was blood. But thankfully, he got enough cells to exert a clinical effect. Had he used Ernegu's technique, uh, he would have tripled his uh, number of uh, MSCs, and the results purportedly could have been even better. So, you need a hemoanalyzer, but with a hemoanalyzer, you can get TNC counts in about 30 seconds. So a good bone marrow aspirate will have some 15 to 25 million TNCs per ml. And once you concentrate it by centrifuging it, you should see a cell count of over 100 million cells per ml. We like to see a 5 or 6x increase uh, or even greater over baseline when you centrifuge bone marrow aspirate. And it is a reasonable assumption that presenter cell concentration increases proportionally to the TNC count. So if your white cell is, uh, count is 15 to 20 million per ml, and it goes up to 100 million per ml, you can infer that your MSC count has also increased proportionally. This is an example of some counting systems that have been used by clinicians. These are desktop units. They're not that terribly costly, uh, but you know, obviously there is some uh, technical expertise needed to utilize this. So what about PRP? Uh, you can also use TNC counts to assess platelet-rich plasma. In peripheral blood, again, five to eight million TNCs per ml, healthy adult. Leukocyte-rich PRP or uh, traditional PRP, the TNCs enrich along with the platelets. 
So if your platelet count goes up, so does your white cell count. It's more inflammatory, whereas now there are protocols that will allow us to obtain platelet leukocyte poor, pardon me, PRP. So the T and Cs are not enriched or even sometimes can be depleted while the platelets are enriched to some degree. It's not quite as inflammatory and ideally there will be very few or uh, no white blood cells in those solutions. In peripheral blood, there's some 150, 250,000 platelets per microliter in a healthy adult. And even a low cost hematology test tube, you can spin it and you can enrich that three times. With a commercial system, you can achieve uh, anywhere from four to 10x increase in platelet count. If you get up closer to 10x, you're gonna undoubtedly increase your white cell count as well. So we really look at generally, perhaps for leukocyte poor, maybe we're hoping for a 4x increase in platelets. And in vitro studies suggest that you need about a million platelets per microliter for optimal MSC proliferation and differentiation. So that's what we generally try to achieve. In vivo, PRP suggests that, the research suggests that 4x enrichment uh, uh, provides uh, optimal conditions, you increase inflammation at high concentrations because you're increasing the WBCs as well. And also it should be noted that if you're thinking about the hemoanalyzer route, some of these don't count platelets. Uh, it's a little more expensive to get a machine that also counts platelets in addition to nucleated cells. There are other components that are important that we can't really count but are important and are found in autologous biologics. Uh, some of these are proteins or cytokines that are soluble in the plasma, not found in the platelets. And there are several of these that are important. One of them that you've probably heard about is alpha-2 macroglobulin. It's not in the platelets, it's soluble in the plasma. So if you throw away your plasma when you make PRP, you're wasting the uh, alpha-2 macroglobulin. This is a natural protease inhibitor and it slows the breakdown of articular cartilage and inhibits arthritic progression. Uh, less inflammation, less pain. Less inflammation allows the local cells to do their job and repair the extracellular matrix and bring that patient back to normal function, hopefully. So you can take that platelet-poor plasma and you can dehydrate it, you can concentrate it, uh, getting rid of water but keeping the protein that you're looking for. And that can be done with another protein called interleukin-1 receptor antagonist protein, which blocks interleukin-1 beta. It's a very strong inflammatory mediator. It blocks activation of macrophage and monocytes, and it slows the breakdown of the cartilaginous matrix. And of interest is that a lot of wealthy people go to Germany to get something called orthokine or regenokine, which is a solution from blood plasma of concentrated interleukin-1 receptor antagonist protein but in bone marrow aspirate plasma, naturally the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist protein levels are 10 to 20 times greater than that in peripheral blood. So you can take the plasma from bone marrow and you've already got more IRAP than in the specific uh, uh, orthokine or regenokine solution that you might travel around the world to get. And this can quickly decrease inflammation and stop pain while the cells that you're injecting are trying to address the underlying cause. So there are a number of different systems that are able to enrich these proteins in the platelet pore by dehydrating the plasma. And it really depends uh, on the size of the pore and the filter as to what you get, and I'll show you that in a minute. But before I do that, I wanna tell you that I think one of the next big jumps in regenerative medicine is gonna be improving how we deliver the therapy. So we're not just gonna be injecting uh, the solution into the joint or the disc uh, and letting it go where it wants to go. We want to really try to control where the solution and the cells go and where they stay, and even try to form a primitive scaffold that allows something for the cells to hang on to. So fibrinogen is the natural scaffold in nature. It's mother nature's scaffold, and it can be concentrated again from the plasma, the platelet poor plasma by ultrafiltration. So I, for years, have used off and on again fibrin sealant from the kit uh, to seal or some other similar product with uh, uh, my uh, biologics, but you don't need to do that. You can take your uh, platelet pore plasma, add a little bit of thrombin and calcium, and you can make your own fibrin sealant quite easily 
on the back table while you're doing your procedure. So when you filter these proteins, be aware that the larger the pore size in the filter, the more of the small proteins you're going to lose. So the reason I say that is the product, there is a product available to make alpha-2 macroglobulin, which has a very large pore size. Well, alpha-2 macroglobulin is a huge molecule. So with that product, you're going to get all the alpha-2 macroglobulin, but you're not going to get any of the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist protein because it's very small. It's 20 kilodaltons as opposed to 700 kilodaltons. So when you look for these products, there's a few on the market. Look at the pore size and figure out what are the proteins that you want because otherwise you're not going to get uh, everything that you might uh, be hoping that you can provide to your patient. So what are other counts that count? Well, it's important to know what the volume is that you can process at one time. If you're doing two knees at the same time or if I'm doing two hips at the same time, I need a lot of volume. Do you have a process? Is your system able to process 120 cc's of blood or BMA at the same time? Well, you need to use two kits. It increases the cost. What if you can only draw 30 ml of BMA if you have an issue? Or what if you're injecting one disc and you only need 2 ml of BMA or BMC? Will your system accommodate low volume processing? Can you supplement the BMA with blood and other fluids to get 60 cc's? And the answer to that is different with different manufacturers and different kits that you might use. So take a look at everything when you decide on a system. Be aware of the number of stellar breaks in the process. There's an increased risk of contamination. How many times does the system open up to the outside to get the uh, process done to concentrate and filter and provide you with your product? That's an important thing to know. It's also important to know when do you use platelet-rich plasma versus bone marrow versus another biologic, exosomes or amniotic products. What type of PRP do you use, leukocyte-rich or poor? What's the best method to aspirate the bone marrow? Should you centrifuge the bone marrow? There's been uh, some uh, sentiment uh, over the last couple of years that with certain needles that uh, you don't need to centrifuge. You get such a high yield with just aspiration that centrifugation is not necessary. And it's certainly cheaper not to centrifuge. Where do you deliver the biologic? Do you put it in the joint space? Do you put it in the disc? Or do you put it in the bone, in the subchondral bone? There is some increasing evidence that subchondral injection may be appropriate in certain areas. Uh, and uh, uh, particularly in the knee, uh, we've been utilizing subchondral injection. Uh, I have not used it in the disc, although Philippe Bernagou uh, reports, although not published, that he's had quite a bit of success with it in the end plate. And Jeff pointed out that some discogenic pain may be end plate in origin, so there may be a reason to consider treating the end plates with the biologic rather than the disc. So PRP is just concentrated platelets from centrifuge for full blood. Uh, there are no stem cells in PRP. The goal with PRP is to create acute inflammation to elicit a response from local MSCs or fibroblasts who can migrate in and repair. And clearly peer-reviewed studies support the use of traditional PRP, that is leukocyte-rich, in tendinopathies and tendinitis. Uh, and target concentration, again, is about a million platelets per microliter, or four to five X above baseline. Leukocyte-rich PRP, more inflammatory, has been classically used for acute soft tissue injuries in vascular or perivascular targets, whereas leukocyte-poor PRP, less inflammation, does provide growth factors in a single dose and plasma proteins, and has been used in avascular structures such as the knee and the disc, and perhaps even the facets, and perhaps even epidural space. It's a low-cost alternative to bone marrow concentrate. And if we're trying to get bone marrow aspirate with the highest number of MSCs, we need to look close to the core or torso of the body. The MSC concentration diminishes quickly towards the extremities. If you make the iliac crest 100% MSC, normalize that. Uh, if you get down to the proximal tibia, you're at 40% in terms of the concentration of MSCs in bone marrow. And when you get down to the calcaneus, you're only at 10%. So if you're trying to get the highest yield of MSCs, or progenitor cells, you really need to harvest from iliac crest either anteriorly or posteriorly. And Hernigo has developed a method to optimize the yield from bone marrow 
aspirate using small syringes, 10 cc syringes, and drawing only about 5 cc's with the syringe. You have to create significant negative pressure with the syringe in order to break the vessels to free the parasites. And once you've done that in any location, if you draw more than 3 or 4 ml, you're just going to get blood. So you're just getting peripheral blood and you're diluting your sample. So after you draw about 5 cc's, you've got to move to another portion of the marrow cavity. And in order to get 60 cc's, you make, have to make several entries into the cortex of the bone. So a uh, little more time consuming, but not that long. Uh, it's very important, however, to do a good job with your aspiration, because otherwise you've subjected the patient to a significant procedure and you've diminished their chance of a positive result. The FDA regards centrifugation as minimal manipulation. It's compliant with 361. You can concentrate nucleated cells uh, and platelets into the Buffy coat while reducing the hematocrit volume. And that's important. If you don't spin, you can't reduce the hematocrit volume. You're getting a lot of red cells in there, and you're not able to concentrate uh, platelets or hematopoietic stem cells uh, if you just use a uh, bone marrow aspirate without spinning it. So it's important to have a good aspiration technique that can significantly increase the MSC concentration in your aspirate. And then it's important to have a good process for concentration that can deliver you most of the bone marrow aspirate MSCs in your final bone marrow concentrate product in a very small volume. So I mentioned this earlier, interesting study by Philippe Bernigou, who is an orthopedic surgeon in Paris. This was 60 patients who had tibial nonunion, and they were treated with mesenchymal stem cells from iliac crest. 53 of the nonunions healed after injection. And of note is that the six or seven that did not heal had the lowest bone marrow concentrate, uh, stem cell concentration. So 100% uh, success if the MSC concentration was over 1,500 cells per ml and 100% failure if it was under 1,500 uh, MSCs per ml. So again, looking towards being able to provide some sort of dose response curve to patients. And I will mention that we were involved in one of the mesoblast studies. And the opposite occurs at the high end. The patients with 18 million cells per ml did not do uh, as well as the patients with uh, uh, 6 or 12 million cells, such that uh, there may be an upper limit as well in terms of uh, efficacy for cellular therapy. So we've got to really develop these, bone, these uh, dose response curves for each of these components in regenerative medicine in order to properly provide it uh, optimally to our patients. Intradiscal biologics are done similar to discography. You can use it cervical about a half cc or two cc's per lumbar. Uh, no contrast or very minimal contrast. You don't want to take up room in the disc. There's not a lot of room. You want to have room for your biologic. And this is from uh, Dr. Patin, and I just point you towards the yellow box, really, just to show you that if the CFUF is less than 2,000, that is, they have fewer stem cells, the VAS improvement was only about 48%, but if the CFUF was greater than 2,000, that is, they had more stem cells in the sample, the VAS improvement was 90% in those patients. So again, uh, perhaps there's a dose response that we're seeing uh, that Hernigo has pointed out to us. We talked about fibrin, nature's scaffold. This can be made by simply adding a small amount of calcium and thrombin to activate your platelet pore plasma. You can make your own bit of fibrin glue and you can inject it after your biologic to seal the cracks and fissures in the disc and hold the biologic in place. Intraarticular injections have been most commonly used for PRP and BMC in the knee and the hip, and of course for uh, visco supplementation and for steroids. Uh, intraosseous uh, has been shown in AVN of the hip by Dr. Ernigu. He showed a 50% reduction in the lesion volume, that is the AVN lesion volume, through 12 years follow-up uh, and in the control group of patients, they not only had no decrease in their uh, uh, lesion volume, but some of them went on to collapse of the femoral head. So you can see that how important it is to treat these patients with AVN early, and uh, he was able to achieve a significant reduction in the lesion volume that 
persisted through a 12-year follow-up, which is uh, uh, quite significant. He also did the same sort of study with uh, some of these patients were followed for 10 to 12 years uh, with uh, subchondral bone marrow concentrate for NeoA, three groups. One group had bilateral TKA, another group had bone marrow concentrate only, and then the third group, which is on the right, which I find the most interesting, the patient had a knee replacement on one side and on the other side had bone marrow concentrate. And there was no difference overall in the pathology from right to left or left to right. And what he found is that with, in this group, an average of six years follow-up, that <coughs> the vast majority, 14 of the patients, preferred the bone marrow knee to the arthroplasty knee. And by the way, all of these patients were over 85 years old. So anybody that tells you that you have to use amniotic or placental products or exosomes in old people, that is not true. So in conclusion, always consider safety, efficacy, and regulatory compliance. Don't get ahead of your skis. Don't promise patients that you're going to cure their Lou Gehrig's disease or whatever it may be with intrathecal stem cells or exosomes injected at C12 or something like that. Uh, if you're doing bone marrow concentrate, MSC counts are critical. If you're doing PRP, platelet counts are, are also critical to know what you're injecting to know you did a good job of harvest and processing. Cytokines and A2M and IRAP and fibrinogen can be concentrated from the platelet pore, both in the bone marrow concentrate and in the plasma. Uh, the robustness of your process to handle all these scenarios is important. And finally, again, maximize or minimize, pardon me, your sterile breaks to maximize your infection control. And thank you very much.